All right. Well, hey, everybody, we're going to kick off and uh, thank you all for those who did uh, go back and get familiar with Genesis chapter uh, chapters three through 13. Uh, some of it, uh, we're not going to hit the high spots um, because, you know, that's what we wanted y'all to reread it for. Um, but we talked about Moses last time. We talked about the fact that, um, you know, he was uh, using the Jude 1-1 model. Um, Moses was special. He was he was uh, called for a special purpose. In other words, he was sanctified. Uh, then he was preserved. <laughs> and, you know, we made a, made a point about, it. isn't it ironic? That, that the one who is going to have to yield to him in the future is the one that was going to uh, have to feed him and, and clothe him and raise him up and train him and things like that. And so that Pharaoh was the one that, uh, Pharaoh in the palace is the one that gave Moses, uh, preserved Moses alive and, and grew him up to be strong and a, 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 a warrior. Uh, and then he was called at the burning bush. And uh, if y'all remember the burning bush, uh, Moses had had uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Moses had, had fled after he killed the Egyptian and buried him in the in the sand. He fled to the land of Midian, which is all the way over into Saudi Arabia, and that's where he had the burning bush incident and married uh, Jethro's daughter, one of Jethro's daughters, and had some kids. And Moses has made his way back to Egypt now. And uh, we we took you that far last time, so Sonar, take take it off, sweetie. So um, I I think that something that we didn't actually cover was when Moses, you know, got to um, Egypt uh, in the very beginning. God had given him some signs to do. He told him to do this. He said, "How are the people gonna uh, believe that you've sent me?" And so he gave him some signs to do for the people. He actually does those and the people seem to believe him. And they, it even says um, in the Bible, it says that um, when they heard that the Lord had visited the children of Israel and that he had looked on their affliction, then they bowed their heads and worshiped. And so you're thinking, okay, we're on track here. Everything's fine. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, Y'all who don't know, that's the last, that's a uh, verse 31 out of chapter five, uh, four, mm -hmm. 431 is where that, that says that. But we know that it, it, uh, if you pay attention in to the detail, it says Moses and Aaron call the elders together. Mm -hmm. So uh, since we know the physical evidence shows that, that uh, there were some people who had enough sense to, to uh, give Moses, Moses credit for, for participating they still tried to give uh, one of the Egyptian gods uh, credit for for what Moses was doing. So yeah, we'll, we'll get into all that. Yeah, yeah we'll we'll, we'll get into all that. But but that uh, for those of you taking notes, that's uh, Exodus four thirty, uh, four thirty one. So so the next thing that happens is basically he goes and says, "Let my people go," and uh, he doesn't let him go. He increases the burden. Things get worse, uh, but it. it if you've been following along with us, you know that we've been studying uh, Exodus. And I think I, I admitted to y'all that I, it was a long time before I knew that Exodus meant exit, but that is what it means. It means the exit. And so understanding uh, that we're relying on the Bible for all of our information, something that I wanted to bring out that we keep forgetting to talk about that we've talked about with ourselves before is that one of the methods that they had or the method that they had for uh, recording the Bible scripture and that the, the Hebrew people were the perfect people to keep up with God's word because um, tell them, do you remember the details about, mm -hmm. go ahead and tell them about the, um, the how they- The Hebrew, the Hebrew rabbis, uh, basically the group called the scribes, uh, you hear some people say, well, those were the lawyers. Well, Kinda. They were the ones who knew the law, but the reason, one of the reasons they knew the law so well is because the scribes were just that. They were scribes. They were the ones who painstakingly copied pre-existing manuscripts so that they could multiply the number of copies of the Hebrew Bible in existence. And the way they would do that, and, and this is, I'm going to hit this real quick. 
Every letter of a Hebrew word has a number value. Every word in Hebrew has a value. Mm -hmm. And what they would do is when a scribe, you know, turned to whoever was supervising him and said, hey, I think I'm through. Well, they would take the paper he was writing on and they would they would compare it to the paper he was he was copying from and they would count the the letters and the words vertically and horizontally from top to bottom and in, if they did not come out with the exact same value of all the words on the copied page as they had on the page from which they were copying he would have to the scribe would have to throw it away and start over Mm -hmm. that's how meticulous they were in preserving in first of all, making sure that uh, the Hebrew Bible was preserved, but then also to be able to multiply the number of copies that could be passed around and, and uh, uh, forward to, you know, synagogue when new synagogues would spring up, making sure they had their copies of the Torah, the Torah obviously being the first five books of the Bible. That was the first thing. That was number one. They had to have that in order to be a synagogue. And uh, and then the other books that came along, every time a scribe would copy a page, the, 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 the total value from top to bottom and right to left, remember Hebrew is read right to left, not left to right like we do. Uh, the, at, at the end of the day, the total value of that page that, that he just got through with had to equal the value of the page he was copying from or else he would he would know he had an error. And if you looked at actual Hebrew manuscripts, you would say, man, there ain't no way I'm going to see where my mistake was because, yeah. you know, there's so many words on, on a page. Not only that, but they also went to the center of the book mm -hmm. and they marked the center word. And then they would count all the way to see if they got to the same number to the center. And then they would count all the way to the back. So they had all kinds of ways to proof check and make sure that everything was perfect. And they say that uh, it is absolutely rare to ever find a manuscript, like even the Dead Sea Scrolls, that had just one little thing off. Yep. Everything was kept so perfectly. So now we may have mistranslated some of this. We may have made some errors and really fully uh, developing the language. We being me and you, or we t we, we be in the modern world. Okay. Uh, in in English or Dutch or whatever it's translated into, but they didn't make mistakes in recording it and keeping it perfectly recorded. I think we can uh, agree about that. Very very uh, right. purposeful. Yeah. So go ahead. I'm trying. I'm trying to get this off of here. Can you hold on to just a second? Okay. So. But to better understand what we're looking at right now, we kind of have to put ourselves in uh, Egypt. We, we, we need to be in that environment. We need to imagine the setting there, the streets of commerce, the temples, the powerful Egyptian gods, powerful, uh, constant worship of these gods in the background going on every single day of their lives. Um, the pyramids are in the background of, of all this which was a, a constant reminder of the importance and power and authority of these pharaohs. Yeah. Plus the, um, the flippancy, let's call it of, of pharaohs just, uh, you know, a pharaoh comes to power. There's no telling, you know, the changes he, he, he would want to make. Oh yeah. They would make radical changes yeah. when a new pharaoh would come in, but now, everybody had their little favorite gods. Everybody had gods. Even and, and sorry to say, I mean, even the um, Hebrew people, they worship these pagan gods as well. Mm -hmm. Many, many, many of them. Yeah, we covered that. Yeah. Uh, the one thing I want to tell you is one of the things that would happen in this particular case, because of our Judeo-Christian heritage that we've, we've come to receive as being grafted in, uh, being saved uh, uh, Gentiles, grafted into the... Uh, the body of Christ, we find out that in the providential hand of God, a particular Pharaoh had moved his capital to very, very close to where all the Hebrews lived, or at least principally lived. 
back in the day when Moses came back from the land of Midian, from Saudi, from Arabia, guess where he found the Pharaoh? Not very far from where all the Hebrew people were. So that's just one of the, the things that, you know, is, is um, something that's common about Egyptian history. Go ahead, Mama. So, so we're going to jump into the plagues themselves. And the Bible pretty much relates a showdown where the gods of Egypt are met with the one true God and experience his power, uh, his authority above all, over all. Uh, the 10 plagues that befall Egypt, I always thought, well, why, why did he decide bulls? Why did he, what was, what was the big deal about that? What, why those 10 plagues? Yeah. But what we found out yeah, in studying. Let me ask one question and it's going to be a rhetorical question. Nobody has to answer, but how many before tonight would know that they, that the plagues had a purpose? That's just a rhetorical question. Go other ahead. than a, a purpose, other than uh, getting them to let them go. Well, I'm, I mean, I'm following what you're saying. Right. The plagues that were chosen to be exercised. Mm -hmm. That's my question. Yeah. So go ahead. So the 10 plagues that befall Egypt are not in any way random. They're, they're, they're not just a series of catastrophes. They were strategic and pointed to certain deities worshipped by the Egyptians. Uh, I call it poke them in the eye. And, and it's a, it, once you know this, it's clear to see how each plague was a direct attack on one of the little G gods that the Egyptians revered. These plagues were in no way random. As we've told you before, there's over 2,000 Egyptians and goddesses, gods and goddesses. They had lots of goddesses um, of that day, but they're were a few that were considered a, a major gods. I think they called it a pantheon. Mm -hmm. Pantheon. Anyway, let's go to the next slide. Uh, so the first plague that we had, of course, was the water turned to blood, and the Nile was the lifeline in all of Egypt. And this is, I don't know how you say it, but I'm thinking it's Hopi, the Egyptian god of the Nile. God sent the first plague on the Nile River. Its water was turned to blood. Pharaoh's magicians were able to copy this in some form, uh, but they were not able to turn the blood back to water. Only God was able to do that. So here we have Hopi, the Egyptian god of the Nile. He's a water bearer and the water is turned to blood. So we start seeing this attack. Then Heket was the second one. Uh, the Egyptian goddess of Fertility, water, renewal. Uh, she had the head of a frog. So what was the second play? The frogs. The frogs coming from the Nile River. Uh, they were <laughs> that's all... A great, that's a great land. picture. Can you it imagine that density of frogs, not just in the Nile, but coming out of the Nile and being everywhere, in everything, all your clothes. Go ahead, Mama. They were in their houses. They were in their food. They were in their clothing. Every place possible that they could be. So uh, Pharaoh's magicians were able to bring a few frogs. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, there again, only God was able to make them go away. Pharaoh still refused to let the people go. Yeah, let's pause right here before you click that. What's one of... Satan's favorite ways to deceive children of God? Isn't it deceiving? Isn't it mimicking? Isn't it copying? And so for these first two first two plagues, but again, here's, here's something unique. The Bible says that the magicians were only able to do it after they had, um, they had, uh, spoken their incantations, their spells, their their uh, pleas to, to their gods. The magicians could only do it after they had appealed to the gods. Moses and Aaron didn't have to appeal to anything. They just knew they had God on their side, and they could just order it. When God spoke it, it happened. And uh, so I just want to make that point that uh, the Bible did make that, uh, uh, give us that detail that, 
that they could only they they could do it, but they could only do it by incantations and spells and uh, that sort of thing. Gib, uh, so plague number three, uh, from the dust of the earth, God brought either lice or gnats. Uh, different translations say different things, but I've always heard it was lice. Mm. Uh, and here we see Gib. He is the Egyptian god of the earth. The magicians are finally completely humiliated here because they can't reduce this effect at all. They even comment in the scripture, this is the finger of God. Uh, that, that to me would be just the most horrible thing. <laughs> well, being from, you know, being from Mississippi, we can speak on gnats and how worrisome gnats can be can you imagine just clouds and clouds and clouds of gnats that are unending never ceasing until moses you know took them away you know i'm not saying that the little g gods weren't performing some type of supernatural um mat you know Acts. power using some type of power but it'd be pretty hard to hide a bunch of gnats in your pocket <laughs> you know i mean Especially when you see how the Bible describes how widespread they were and how they got, right, right. how they afflicted every everything. And, and obviously, it's an attack on you know the God of the earth. You know, so yep, yeah, because it was dust. Mm -hmm. When he threw dust up into the air, that's when they turned into into the gnats. Right. And then we've got uh, probably Hepri. That's uh, how you say that. We we just murder these names. We just act like we know how to say them. We don't know how to say them. Um, but swarms of flies on uh, on Pharaoh, Pharaoh's officials, and on Pharaoh's people, and the Egyptians' houses would be full of flies. Even the ground was covered with them. Uh, but God's people in the land of Goshen had no flies. So this is one, the first play where he pretty much you know differentiates and says, "Look, I'm, I'm not going to do this to my people. I'm just going to do it to your people. You still won't let them go. Uh, this is going to be on you and your people." Um, so the God that I believe was attacked, you know, here was uh, this one you see depicted. He had the head of a fly or a scarab beetle uh, anytime he was depicted. So an insect was um, his his kind of calling card. Uh, so God said, so that you will know that I am the Lord in this land, I will make a distinction between my people and your people. So that's what was happening with that plague. Uh, oh, this is where Pharaoh tried to compromise, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. He tried to compromise and uh, he said, y'all just go ahead and sacrifice. Y'all can do it here. Y'all can do it just here. Just don't go too far away. Yeah. And Moses said, no, that's not going to work. Uh, we need to travel three days into the wilderness to make sacrifices. And he gave several excuses. I almost thought he was at, at that point, he was kind of uh, trying to still work with Pharaoh. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. but, but. Hathor, we've talked about Hathor before. And somebody said that this was the first cowgirl. <laughs> I think, I think that, I think that was last week. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but let my people go. If you refuse, the hand of the Lord will bring a terrible plague on your livestock in the field, on your horses, donkeys, camels, and your livestock. So Hathor was the Egyptian goddess of love and protection, was usually depicted with the head of a cow. So here you go, Hathor. Do something about that with your love and protection. Oh, can you back up one? Uh, you got to remember now that um, only Egyptian livestock died. Okay, uh, Hebrew livestock That's true. was not affected by this plague. Mm -hmm. So early on, these were blanket plagues, no differentiation except for um, visible sources of what the power was that invoked the plagues. Um, and then very quickly, that became differentiated. But then as you move along, you, you see that it's clear that as the plagues pro progress, God is wanting to make it clear that the Israelites belong to him. 
ISIS. Uh, this is this plague is unannounced. The sixth Egyptian plague is given for the first time directly attacking the Egyptian people themselves. Uh, being instructed by the Lord, Moses took ashes from the furnace and threw them into the air. And as the dust from the ashes blew all over Egypt, it settled on man and beast alike in the form of boils and sores. Uh, now, Isis was the Egyptian goddess of medicine and peace. And uh, she seems to be the target of God's judgment here. You notice, um, I don't know if y'all looked at many of these, but you see uh, the headdress that she has. Where's my little pointer? Do I have a pointer? It's right there. there. This. Oh, I didn't do it. Laser point right there. That. That's the headdress of Ra. So this, this system of um, gods and goddesses and all this, super, super complex. I tried to go in and really look at some of these uh, people in depth and went on some sites where people are just, that's all they do. They're experts in uh, Egyptology and the gods of Egypt. And it's the most complex system you've ever seen. I, I don't know how they had the ability to keep up with which God was which and who had been begot by who begot. And, <laughs> I mean, it, it is unbelievable. Yeah. And and there would be varying um, stories of how they came into existence. And it, it was just, it's a lot. It's really a lot. Let's see this one now. I'm sorry. Knut, Knut. <laughs> I think it should be Nut. It's, it's what is it? I think it's Newt. It could be Newt. Nut. We don't know. I know it has a K sound on the beginning of it. Um, the Egyptian goddess of the sky. Uh, you see her arching over there over the pyramids on that little uh, figurine and in some of these hieroglyphic um, copies, uh, so, like a protector. But guess what? Uh, hail rained down in the form of fire and ice. So I think that that guy was pretty much shown up here. Um, let's see, what does he say here? I think I have a scripture reference. He says this time he will send the full force of his plagues against you and against your officials and your people so that you may know that there is no one like me in all the earth. And when Pharaoh refused the worst hailstorm that had ever fallen fell on Egypt. The only place it did not fall was on, you guessed it, Goshen. Uh, I, I'll tell you what, one of the scariest things for me was at this point in the study, uh, you see the two little um, pictures that I have here for you of Knut or Nut or whatever she was, the Egyptian goddess. I started looking for pictures to make it more interesting, right? I, I wanted to have some something for you to look at. And I started realizing that what I was looking at was <laughs> not ancient artifact. Well, of course, I thought they looked too good for that anyway, but these are for sale on Etsy and eBay. Pinterest. All over the place. Egyptian decor. And uh, some of these gods, though, are made out of uh, fine, uh, you know, stones and, and and jewels like jasper and all that, and they cost hundreds and hundreds of dollars. Yeah, these and, are not trinkets. No, they, they, these for worship. These are for worship. Yeah, that's today. That's not yesterday. That is for today. So this is still still going on. Pharaoh still does not let the people go. Y'all know that. Uh, Seth, the Egyptian god of storms and disorder. Here we have plague number eight, which was the plague of locusts. Pharaoh tries to bargain again and says, just let the men go and sacrifice to God. But uh, Moses refuses. I guess he thought if, you know, the women and children and all their livestock were still there, they'd have to come back. But Moses knew they were leaving and they weren't coming back. Yeah, he, he hadn't forgotten what God had told him in the burning bush. They were all going to leave at, at the same time and it was going to be... Uh, when he got through with Pharaoh, that Pharaoh was going to be so glad to see him go, he was going to help him leave. 
So anything left from the previous plagues, which hadn't been beaten down by the hail or, you know, burned up in the fire, uh, locusts uh, cover the land, fill their houses, eat everything that's left. So their their crops are more than gone. Their livestock's gone. Their crops are gone. Um, it says that after the Lord, you know, he decides to take it away because I think Pharaoh even tells him he's going to let him go. Okay, y'all can go. And uh, he changes the wind to a very strong west wind and catches up the locusts and sent them into the Red Sea. The Bible makes a point here where he brought them with a wind from the east and then he took them away with a wind back to the west, into the Red from Sea, the west. from the west. And so he changed the wind because Seth, the Egyptian god of storms, you can see where the wind there was just an attack on him and a show of God's power over everything Seth thought he had power over. Ra, you, you may have even heard of Ra. Yeah. Y'all, this, this is, this is a, a plague such that it needs its own study, but we're not going to, but we can hit some very important things about this. Remember, I showed you the headdress of uh, one of the uh, the goddesses, Ra's the sun god. Um, so unannounced, uh, it seems like once Pharaoh would say he'd let him go and then he'd change his mind, then the next plague was unannounced with, without warning. But unannounced, God has Moses stretch out his hand toward the sky and darkness spreads over Egypt. This darkness was so immense that it could be felt. Um, total darkness for all three days. Yet all the Israelites had light in the places where they lived. I, I'm thinking that's the Shekinah glory, mm -hmm. um, that the light of God. Can y'all imagine what supernatural power Jehovah God had to be exercising so that sunlight is completely not, I mean, during the day, go and try to close all the windows in your house. The sun produces so much light on this earth during the day that it's practically impossible to keep out all light, obviously direct light, but I'm talking about ambient light. Uh, and the fact is here, it says for three days, so that's three nights and three days, they saw no sunlight. Now, folks, that's supernatural. Mm -hmm. God can create the universe. He can suspend the laws of the universe when he gets ready to. So after this one, it was bad enough that Pharaoh tried to let the people go, but he insisted that they leave their herds and their flocks behind. Well, you can understand they, they, why. They, they ain't have, got any. All theirs got wiped out. Yep. All their crops had gotten wiped out. All their livestock had gotten killed. Moses, Moses refused. Uh, Pharaoh was so mad that he told Moses if he saw him again, he was going to kill him. And Moses said, that's fine. You're not going to see me again. <laughs> so anyway, Ra, the sun god. So you can definitely see how three days of darkness was a direct attack on Ra, the sun god. You just imagine, can you hear all the priests crying out to, to Ra? He's killed Ra. In three days? <laughs> you know, Ra, how, 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 why are you Ra? Yeah. Um, th that that brought me to this study. I won't read all these, uh, but there's so much in the Bible talking about us being the children of light, and you 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 can just see just a few of these, uh, you know, from the very beginning. And God said, "Let there be light," and there was light. Um, let's see what's another good one. The other one I think of is Jesus says, put your light up on the hill. Yeah, that's one. It's not even in here. Don't let it be covered by. You, Lord, are my lamp. The Lord turns my darkness into light. Second Samuel. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light, we see light. That's light right there. Psalm 36. Y'all can read those. If yeah. you want to. The whole purpose of that is just to show the contrast between God been able to put three days of absolute darkness on e the Egyptian world. Now, the Bible clearly says that uh, in uh, the the Hebrew homes, they had light. Yeah. But uh, outside of Goshen, 
there was no light to be seen for three solid days. Yeah, here's some more verses. Uh, the book of John is full of verses about children of light. You are all children of the light and the children of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. First Thessalonians 5, 5. So I'll just put some more here. There's also a warning in uh, Second Corinthians, and I, I believe that's the one where he warns that uh, Satan masquerades as as a child of light, light and darkness here again, sin and forgiveness. Here's some more to look at if y'all want to look at them. Yeah, we we in some of our past ones we made the mistake of uh, not including scriptures. Uh, we'll cover stuff and forget to put the scripture passage on there for y'all. Uh, and we're really trying to do a much better job of. Uh, well, what we study. When we're, you want, we're looking at, we're letting them yeah. say what we study too. And uh, that way, when you see the video, uh, you can pause it and take notes and jot down the scriptures and things like that. Now, Keith wants to um, take over and do the, the I'm gonna, final. I'm going to do the 10th plague. And uh, we're going to cover some stuff here. All right. Chapter 10 ends like this. And this is after the, the, the third day of abject darkness on everything but the Israelites. Then Pharaoh summoned Moses and said, go worship the Lord. Even your women and children may go with you. Only leave your flocks and herds behind. But Moses said, you must allow us to have sacrifice and burnt offerings to present to the Lord our God. Our livestock too must go with us, not a hoof to be left behind. We have to use some of them in worshiping the Lord, our God. And until we get there, we will not know what we're to use to worship the Lord. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he was not willing to let them go. Pharaoh said to Moses, get out of my sight. Make sure you do not appear before me again. The day you see my face, you will die. Just as you say, Moses replied, I will never appear before you again. Now, this is how chapter 10 ends, and we're going to jump into chapter 11. 11 and 12, I call chapter 11 the Passover uh, plague uh, by memo. All right, I'm going to remind you about this. This is very important. Remember where the land of Midian is. This is over in Arabia. This is going to be very important that, that you be able to refer to this map when we start talking about the Exodus, okay? There's the land of Midian. This is where Jethro was living when, when uh, Moses was called. In this area is where Mount Sinai is. Now, folks, I'm going to point something to you right now. And I'm going to tell you, historically, archaeologists have tried to put Mount Sinai here in the southern end of the Sinai Peninsula. But there's something wrong with it because all those archaeologists who had a secular worldview weren't trying to follow Scripture. And so a lot of the Scripture has to be ignored for the Mount Sinai to be here. Okay? Mount Sinai, in the last 20 years, because of an explosion of evidence it's now gone global, the internet, uh, YouTube, whatever. I cannot wait to start showing y'all the evidence over here. Okay? Now, this. hit this map. <clears throat> Do what, sweetie? Right here, so you know. okay. All right. Just a reminder, sanctified, preserved, and called. That's Jude 1.1 1, 1 is your uh, scripture reference. This is why we refer to Moses that way. We want to remind you that the Israelites worshiped pagan gods while they were in Egypt. We know this for several reasons. One is scripture, Joshua 24.14, Leviticus 17.7, Ezekiel 26-9. through 9. Stone inscriptions found in the Sinai Peninsula. Here's what Joshua says. Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your ancestors worshiped beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt. Joshua clearly says that it was well known that the Israelites worshiped pagan gods before Moses got back there. 
Okay. Mm. Yep. Here's Leviticus. And, and folks, you need to know this one for sure. Make a note of it. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, this is Leviticus now. This is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. This is the book right after Exodus. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to Aaron and his sons and to all the people of Israel and say to them, this is the thing that the Lord has commanded. If any one of the house of Israel kills an ox or a lamb or a goat in the camp or kills it outside the camp, does not bring it into the entrance of the tent of meeting. The tent of meeting is what? We know that's the tabernacle. To offer it as a gift of the Lord in front of the tabernacle of the Lord, blood guilt shall be imputed to that man. He has shed blood and that man shall be cut off from among his people. Remember, the shedding of blood was, was a sin unless it was done in the ritualistic killings for food or worship. This is to the end of the people may bring their sacrifices that they sacrifice in the open field, that they may bring them to the Lord, to the priest at the entrance of the tent of meeting. And a sacrifice to them is sacrifices of peace offerings to the Lord. And the priest shall throw the blood on the altar of the Lord at the entrance of the tent of meeting and burn the fat for a pleasing aroma to the Lord. Now here's what I highlighted for you. So they shall no more sacrifice their sacrifices to goat demons after whom they whore. Now the word for goat demons, the Hebrew word is S-A space I-R. Sayer. Yeah. And I showed you over here and, and folks, I want you to make note of this. If you put a T in place of that space, what would you have? You would have the word Sater. The Hebrew word is Sater, means goat demon. Put a T there and you will have the word Sater. Sater, S-A-T-I-R, or it's the Greek spelling is actually S-A-T-Y-R is the Greek word for a goat god. Mm -hmm. Now, we've had a hard time even finding um, a depiction that was PG enough to put on here. Yeah, it, I, it was horrible. Yeah, y'all need to know this is a bad dude. Yeah, This was a bad dude. He still is a bad dude. Mm -hmm. And by the way, this is one of those images of a uh, idol, a, a, a contemporary a, idol, a contemporary idol of the goat god, sometimes known as Pan. I think, uh, I think the Romans called him Pan. Yeah, I believe the Romans called him Pan, P-A-N. That, but when we talk about uh, Jesus doing what he did in his ministry and the places he would go and the things he would do and say, this one right here is going to show up again. Okay. I'll give you a hint where Caesarea Philippi. That's all I'm going to say on it right now. All right. And this is Ezekiel 25 through eight. Thus says the Lord God on the day when I chose Israel, I swore to the offspring, making myself known to them in the land of Egypt. I swore to them. I'm the Lord, your God. On that day, I swore to them that I would bring them out of the land of Egypt into a land that I had searched out for them, a land flowing with milk and honey, the most glorious of all lands. And I said to them, cast away the detestable things your eyes feast on every one of you and do not defile yourselves with the idols of Egypt. I am the Lord, your God. But they rebelled against me and were not willing to listen to me. None of them cast away the detestable things their eyes feasted on, nor did they forsake the idols of Egypt. Now, the reason I'm bringing this up is because next week we're going to kick off with the real Exodus. And one of the things that's going to happen is you're going to find out that, you know, well, Snor and I have talked about this. Here's, here's where we want to bring you. Think about it. In the entire history of Egypt's 2,000 named identifiable gods, obviously everybody wasn't worshiping 2,000 gods all at the same time. They would be groups of them in regions. They would be... Uh, smaller groups of them in, in this uh, area west of the river. There'd be the, another group of them uh, in, in the uh, southern parts of Egypt and so on. But they were pagan. All of them were pagan. Now, 
you think about it. Here's Jehovah God being first spoken of in 430 something years by Moses. And in their mind, they're, you know, put, remember what Snar said earlier, put ourselves in their position. Is this another equal God, a, a, a supernatural being who's just a, one of many? Who is this Jehovah God? Now, uh, we, we, when we talked about it, we said things like uh, the people were probably, I mean, they've got 2,000 gods. They're not surprised by another god. And they're putting him probably at that time on the same level as any other god they have until what we just went through, where we went through and showed y'all how he attacked each one of their gods with the plagues mm -hmm. and how he called them out and how he showed them up. Yeah, you can just imagine when, when Moses first gets there, they're trying to go, now does he fit above Ra or is he above Ra or he below yeah, Ra? Where is he in this Where's, Where does he fit in all this? Mm -hmm. That's probably what, you know, we got, let's say we got uh, six people on tonight. That's That's where the six of us would be. That's where we would be. Is where where does this where does this Jehovah God fit in? Mm -hmm. As if he had to be because made to fit in. They wouldn't be surprised. They the wouldn't be surprised. Of a new God, right? And and but but they were probably saying, well, "Who is this new God, and why is he so mad at us? Now, and what what did our gods do that angered him, or what did you know?" They would be trying to figure all that out would, because we're going to see that a little bit later on. I exactly. Think. But the one thing that that Moses did get their attention with. Number one was he told them, this is the God who's going to get us out of here. Mm -hmm. I'm going to lead you, and he's the one that's going to make it happen. So true enough, at the end of chapter four, they started worshiping Jehovah. But you got to remember where they were, where they've come from, where they've been for 430 years, okay? And it's going to show up again when Moses gets on Mount Sinai uh, trying to get the Ten Commandments. And he stays up there a little too long. What happens down in the camp? We don't need to go there tonight, but you know what happens. All right. This is something we covered last time. I'm not going to. Well, we stay just up. covered it a while ago. Yeah. Uh, the the yeah, no need on the livestock. Right. No need to, to hang on. But here's why it's important. Remember these that I covered last week for y'all? Mm -hmm. These are real archaeological things, they exist. The, the inscriptions where they they're they're specifically these are Hebrew the the it says Hebrew writing obviously early Hebrew writing talking about worshiping Hathor okay went through this before did I go through the one on Moses the Moses inscription yeah right there. and I asked y'all last time if you remember this I said did y'all even know that an inscription written in Hebrew specifically named Moses by name. Now, what they got wrong was what? The things that Moses did that were astonishing, they tried to give him credit to, to the lady, to the god Hathor. We know who The cowgirl, Mike. Yeah, the cowgirl. But did y'all know that? This is a real inscription. It's got its names, Moses by name. In uh, the Sinai Peninsula. So we covered that. All right. Now, here's the memo. This is what I call Chapter 11. This is the play. It's a Passover. And we're told about it. I call it in memo form. The Lord said to Moses, Yet one plague more will I bring upon Pharaoh and upon Egypt. Afterward, he will let you go from here. When he lets you go, he will drive you away completely. Speak now in the hearing of the people that they asked every man of his neighbor and every woman of her neighbor for silver and gold jewelry. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. Moreover, the man Moses was very great in the land of Egypt, in the sight of Pharaoh's servants and the sight of the people. You notice he names everybody but who? Pharaoh himself. All right, God told Moses there will be one more plague. Afterward, not only will Pharaoh let you go, he'll drive you away, tell all the people to ask every Egyptian neighbor to give you gold and silver. By that time, most all of the Egyptian population saw that the God of Moses was more than just above and greater than any of their, of their gods. Who will die? 
the firstborn, male or female, of each person, even the firstborn of cattle. Where will this plague strike? All of the land of Egypt. When? Soon, but it'll strike at midnight. God will distinguish between the Egyptians and the Israelites. As long as they have the this, blood. This is, blood. yes, this is basically uh, a, an encapsulation of the memo version that's given to us in verse in uh, chapter 11. Well, then here we go to chapter 12, where there were very few verses in chapter 11. There's a lot of verses in chapter 12, and they go into a lot greater detail. So let's hit the high spots. This month is to be for you the first month, the first month of your year. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. The animals you choose must be year old males without defect. The Hebrew word there is tamen, meaning perfect, whole, without blemish or deformity. Do y'all remember when we covered Noah mm -hmm. back in Genesis? When the Bible said that Genesis, uh, was Noah perfect was in perfect in his generations, and I told y'all then that the word perfect in describing uh, Noah's lineage and bloodlines was the same word that was used later for the sacrificial lambs, the, the standards that had to be had that had to be met for a lamb to be uh, used in sacrifice. And you may take them from the sheep or the goats. Take care of them until the 14th day of the month, when all the members of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. That means in the evening at sundown. Then they are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. That same night they are to eat the meat roasted over the fire, along with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. Do not eat the meat raw or boiled in water, but roast it over a fire with the head, legs, and internal organs. That means burn the skin off of them and cook them right then and there. Do not leave any of it till morning. If some is left till morning, you must burn it. This is how you are to eat it. With your cloak tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. Eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. This is Exodus 12, 6 through 11. And uh, I'm referring to 1 Kings 18, 46 and 1 Peter 1, 13. That's NIV, right? Yeah. I, I like the, this is NIV. Okay. I like the gird up your loins one. Well, I'm, I'm going to show you that in just a minute. Okay. <laughs> All right. This slide, we call it Be Ready for Action. Uh, the power of the Lord came on Elijah and tucking his cloak into his belt he ran ahead of Ahab all the way to Jezreel. That's 1 Kings 18, 46. That is the NIV. But where most of us older folks have caught it is uh, using the phrase, gird up your loins. And this is 1 Peter 1, 13, where, Paul, where Peter says, therefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober and rest your hope, rest. I'm sorry, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's 1 Peter 1.13. Now, over here to the right, I'm showing you what somebody who girded up their loins actually looks like. That's and pretty what, good, but I would have drawn it with the tail of it tucked in his belt. Well. That's pretty good, though. That's pretty good. Keith didn't want to try to demonstrate it, so he got him a picture. Yeah, y'all don't y'all don't hold that against me, but gird up the loins is basically slang. Uh old, I mean it's it's a older English slang. Gird up your loins is for someone who's wearing a tunic and a belt to take the backside of the uh skirt. tunic, yeah. <laughs> the skirt part of the of the tunic, and bring it between your legs and out in front of you, and then push it into the belt. And what this did was, number one, it, it would allow you to run when you needed to. And number two, it would basically protect your your uh, specials. <laughs> okay? But that, so let, let me point, go back one slide I think the here. The point that needs to be made as to why they were supposed to do that. Well, that, that'll be obvious very shortly. Okay. With your cloak tucked into your belt, and, you know, if you're King James or New King James, says 
gird with your uh, gird up your loins, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. And you got to remember, at sundown they started cooking these uh, these uh, sacrificial lambs, and so that night they had to keep their clothes on. They had to have their their uh, tunics tucked up, and they had to keep the sandals on all night. Here's why. On that same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both people and animals, and I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. That's Exodus 12, 12 through 13. Now, this is God talking to Moses, okay? Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said to them, basically, this is where Moses repeats to the elders what God had told Moses. Kill the Passover, only now he's calling it the Passover lamb. And you shall take a bunch of hyssop, dip it in the blood that is in the basin, and strike the lintel and the two doorposts. The lintel is the cross, the solid cross piece that sat atop the two the two side posts. The lintel was the beam that went from top to top, and that held the top of the door up that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out of the door of his house until morning. For the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and not allow the destroyer to come into your houses to strike you. God came with the death angel with him. Okay. And that's Exodus 12, 21 through 23. And you shall observe this thing as an ordinance for you and your sons forever. It will come to pass when you come to the land, which the Lord will give you, just as he promised that you shall keep this service. And it shall be when your children say to you, what do you mean by this service that you get to say, it is the Passover sacrifice of the Lord who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians and delivered our households. So the people bowed their heads and worshiped. Then the children of Israel went away and did so, just as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron, so they did. And it came to pass at midnight that the Lord struck all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne to the firstborn of the captive who was uh, uh, in the dungeon and all the firstborn of livestock. So Pharaoh rose in the night, he, all his servants, and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where there was not one dead. Can you imagine? I would be dead. I'm firstborn. All right, and the Exodus begins. Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron by night and said, Rise, go out from among my people, both you and the children of Israel, and go, serve the Lord as you have said. Also take your flocks and your herds as you have said, and be gone. And bless me also. That's the part I don't understand. I don't either. <laughs> now, if, if, what does he if, mean? If Pharaoh hadn't changed his mind and, and chased after him, would he have been blessed? We don't know. Maybe bless me also means it'll be a favor to me also. I'm not sure. Could be. Okay. And the Egyptians urged the people that they might send them out of the land in haste, for they said, we shall all be dead. So the people took their dough before it was leavened, having their kneading bowls bound up in their clothes on their shoulders. Now the children of Israel had done according to the word of Moses, and they had asked from the Egyptians articles of silver, articles of gold, and clothing. And the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, so that they granted them what they requested. Thus they plundered the Egyptians. Isn't that what God told Abraham? That when he finally, uh, when he would finally bring the the, his uh, Abraham's descendants out of Egypt that they were going to leave with way more than they went with. They went into Egypt as a family. They leave Egypt you, you as a very Abraham? wealthy. Huh? You, you said he told Abraham that. Yeah, in the Abrahamic covenant. Well, that they would be blessed. Yeah. Yeah, that they would that they would be blessed mm -hmm. on their way out. Yeah. 
They went in as a family. They came out as a mighty nation That's right. and a wealthy nation. We said we were going to talk about here, and we've already talked about it some, um, the fact that they were so um, accustomed to uh, the, the God system and the fact that, you know, they asked, because because we, why would they give them, you know, their gold and silver and all that? And we had talked about that. If any other time, they wouldn't have. But after they had watched nine plagues strike them, they knew, like I said a while ago, it seemed like everybody but Pharaoh knew there's something special about these people. There's something special about Moses. There's something special about this God. It, there's something special about this God that Moses has brought to us and the people that this God claims is his own. You can imagine them saying, uh, what, what, what's happening? Why is your God so mad? And they said, look, he, he says he wants us to go out and sacrifice to him. And he's not going to let up until we do. They said, here, take this. Take this. Take this silverware. Go. Get, <laughs> get out of here. That's right. All right. The Exodus begins. The children of Israel journey from Ramesses to Sukkoth. And got to remember, Ramesses is a, is a city that was... Uh, built um, after the Hebrews had uh, the children of Jacob had made it into Goshen to Sukkoth, about 600,000 men on foot besides children. Now, this is where most biblical scholars, when you read commentaries, they will say that when the nation of Israel left Egypt, they were somewhere between a million and 2.5 million in total because they numbered 600,000 men. Just the men counted 600,000. They had to bring their flocks and herds, a great deal of livestock, and they baked unleavened cakes for the dough, which they had brought out of Egypt. For it was not leavened because they were driven out of Egypt and could not wait, nor had they prepared provisions for themselves. Remember what God told them? This Passover meal, eat it with your clothes on, your stuff tucked up, your shoes on and your uh, staff ready to go. We're not. That's it. Okay. All right. This is the map I want to show y'all because this is where we are right here. Tell Ed Dobby that is Avaris. That is that is the modern day name for the location of the ancient city of Avaris and what. What did we study was the city of Avaris. That's That was basically the capital of the Hebrew uh, settlement when Jacob came down and brought the, the uh, rest of the brothers and, and they settled to be with Joseph. It was at Avaris and the modern day name is Tel, Al, Tet, Tel Ed Daba. All right. So when they left, they left from there and went to Sackoff, and that's as far as we're going to get uh, tonight. But I wanted you to have this map, and I'm going to show you one more map just so you can put it in place. Back and forth between them so you can see. Oh, did I miss one? There we go. All right. This right here is the Sinai Peninsula. This is the Sinai Peninsula. The land of Midian is over here, way down here, okay? Over here is the Nile River. And this is the land of Goshen. Now let me put the other map back up. Now does it make sense? There's the city of Ramesses. There's Sukkoth. Here's the land of Goshen. Here's the Nile River Delta, remember? Okay, there's the Nile River flowing from south to north. Here's the Sinai Peninsula. There's the Dead Sea, Sea of Galilee. All of this is Canaan right here. Okay, this is where God wants them to end up. But he first takes them from here, and they're going to end up over here. And let me go back to this map. And this pretty much, in the last 40 years, this is pretty much where the line is going to take people. And folks, you are going to be astounded 
at all the evidence, some of it supernatural, plain out supernatural that God had to do to make all this work and get them over here in the in the land of, of the Medes, because this is where Mount Sinai actually is. This is where Jethro was living. This is where Moses was when the burning bush happened. So this is where they're coming back to before they start north. Okay. All right, we're doing pretty good on time. Final thoughts number one. God also said to Moses, I am the Lord, Yahweh. Well, first of all, the, the, the Hebrew word used here, uh, and this, by the way, is Exodus 6, 2 through 4. God, Elohim, also said to Moses, I am the Lord. And he's using the Yahweh word here. We're, we're saying Yahweh. That's as close as we know to get. Yeah, to this is, when you see the word the Lord in this context, it's the I am. It is the great I am. And it, it goes on to say, I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. That's El Shaddai. But by my name, the Lord, Yahweh, I did not make myself fully known to them. Excuse me. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan where they resided as foreigners. Now, here's my question. Why the distinction from Moses and the Israelites in the name that God is going to tell them as opposed to the name El Shaddai that he used with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Make yourself a note just to pause here and ponder over. This is final thoughts too. I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. And that goes back. I read it while I go. Exodus 12, 12. What does that remind you of? Where have we studied this before? How about Psalms 82? God has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. I said, you are gods, sons of the most high, all of you. Nevertheless, like men, you shall die and fall like any man. And then the psalmist, this is God speaking to his little G gods. And then in verse eight, the psalmist says, arise, O God, judge the earth, for you shall inherit all the nations. Well, what did he just do to the Egyptian gods? Final thoughts three. <laughs> what? I'm just laughing at how many final thoughts you have. How final is this? <laughs> Go ahead. I, I see, couldn't help it. I see y'all laughing. I couldn't help it. I see all y'all laughing. <laughs> final thoughts three. God chose the Israelites, but they were worshipers of pagan gods in Egypt. Do we have our own idols? We are redeemed in exactly the same way as the Israelites. God's covenant is the basis for their redemption, not their faith. Remember Ezekiel 25 through 8. He says, y'all were so sinful, I should have killed you. Mm -hmm. But I couldn't do that because then it would have made me look bad to the rest of the world. So I stuck to what I promised. I stuck to my covenant. That's basically what, he, what he's saying. Because that's... Too it, long, that's what makes God God. Correct. That he does do that. All right. What about our covenant? What about the covenant God gave us? John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Mm -hmm. John 3, 16. That's a covenant God made with all of us. Do we have a better covenant now? Maybe. Or maybe not. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. Hmm. It's a point to ponder. Even our faith is a gift of God. Even our faith is a gift from God. Final thoughts, six. The Passover month is Nisan. 
chose the perfect Passover lamp. Uh, I'm sorry, choose the perfect Passover lamb on the 10th of the month. The 14th day is the Passover started at sunset. And this month started the Hebrew calendar in the spring. Hebrew, the Hebrews start their calendar. They don't start with January like we do. Their uh, Hebrew calendar starts with the month of Nisan because that's the month in which, in which the Passover occurred. Next week, on the road again. Just can't wait to get on the road again. Done. Okay. Final thought number 525. <laughs> All right, Mama. That's okay. Let's unmute. Uh, people may have questions. You may wait.